I'm Matt Carey, documentary editor at Deadline.com, and we are in the Deadline studio at Sundance for the film Seeking Mavis Beacon, which is premiering in the next section of Sundance. We are here with the director and lead investigator, Jasmine Jones. Hello. And with the co-collaborator, producer, and investigator, Olivia Michaela Ross. Hello. Thank you so much. So investigator, that's a somewhat rare title in documentary. Tell us what you are investigating here in this film. Yeah, so Seeking Mavis Beacon, it's all in the title. We are Seeking Mavis Beacon. She was a fictional typing teacher who came out in the late 80s, early 90s, and taught about 10 million people to type. Olivia and I were super interested in who the woman was on the software, um, given that it's really the first time any human was anthropomorphized in technology, but especially, you know, we're interested in black history. Uh, and so we wanted to hear more about what led to the casting of a black woman and what her experience was. Right. And the, and the black woman who was cast, and again, this is back in the day when there, there'd be, you know, going to Best Buy and there's software on the shelf. Like, wow, that's how you got it. And you put a CD-ROM in or whatever it was, uh, the people who created the software hired a woman named Renee L'Esperance mm -hmm. and and you go and, and in many ways it could have been called seeking Renee L'Esperance because you're really trying to find out who this woman was and if she was still alive. Yeah there's I, I'll let Olivia speak more to this but there are in total five different Mavis Beacons and so at the onset of this project we weren't really sure are we looking for each Mavis Beacon um, and I think the more we got to the bottom of it it's like Renee L'Esperance was the blueprint, um, and she was Mavis Beacon for about a decade before they started switching out and recasting, which is definitely a part of the narrative. And the reason they did that recasting was like because she was the face of Mavis Beacon, and they wanted to kind of um, separate the like kind the power that accumulates when everybody associates your face with like this specific typing software. So it felt like pretty right to kind of hone in on her and her story rather than to try and like make a very expansive documentary on every single woman who was on the cover, even though we do know all of their names and are in contact with a couple of them. Oh, wow. It's, a, it's fascinating. I mean, what's incredible about the film is how, how complex it is and the, how you're probing so many really rather fundamental questions about our culture. For instance, what was novel, unusual, is to have a black woman on the cover. Like, here's a black woman, as you point out in the film, not often associated necessarily with expertise mm -hmm. and certainly in technology. So that's very interesting in and of itself. But you go further than that and you describe her as the Aunt Jemima of technology. Mm -hmm. pretty, can you expand on that some and that, that element of exploration in the film? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a phrase I used when we were at the onset of the investigation. And I think for people who have no familiarity with the story, it just helps lock it in where it's like, oh, we all know Aunt Jemima was a fictional character. We all know that she there's probably a real person that can be linked back to the name and the image and that there was a lot of racialized choices made that led to that. So as a shorthand, I think it's a great way to pull people in. But I also think that it kind of discredits... Um, both Aunt Jemima and Mavis Beacon. I think that I really appreciate Mandy Harris Williams as an interview subject in the film. And she describes Mavis Beacon as a character who is problematized. Um, so at the beginning of the project, I was like, yes, Mavis Beacon is a problematic fave. But it's like, wait, she herself was not the problem. It's all of the things that we put onto her as a society that problematize this character. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, and one of the notable things, certainly, though, that you explore is... Uh, wonderful, you know, she's on, on the cover, it, you know, becomes enormously uh, popular software, makes a ton of money for the people who've made it. Now, Renee didn't make much money off of it, and that's a whole other part of the film. But it's also idea of a woman, and particularly a black woman, as helper. Yeah. Who is she helping? Yeah, there's, um, there's a sense of, like, a lot of people's, like, first... Like encounters with artificial intelligence at like a really pivotal time both like in school in terms of age, the ages of people who might have been using it and the like novelty of the technology um, to kind of house what's like a new technology in the body of like a dark-skinned black woman 
in order to make it more like acceptable or like easier to integrate. And like, no, it isn't weird that this computer is analyzing my typing habits. It's in the body of Mavis. Be Mavis Beacon is analyzing my typing habits, not not this mystical, not this software that's inside of a box, and kind of creating that separation between like a program instead of instructions, and housing it in like an anthropomorphized figure, kind of. Um, one of our interview subjects, Stephanie Dinkins, talks about how um, the choice to house an AI in the body of a woman, and particularly a black woman, is because as a society, like as we live under patriarchy, it's very easy to kind of see women in this, these servile roles, right? Like we're, our society is kind of replete with these servile fembots, <laughs> like Siri, Alexa, and Kirtana, and Jazz and I really um, believe that it's quite possible that Mavis Beacon was kind of the prototype for these kinds of encounters with artificial intelligence because you have you know something that you know like will not supersede you and is the thing that is advancing you rather than the thing that is advanced you mm. know which is like really pivotal when you're trying to bring something into your computer and even the computer is new in the house so like it better not start talking to you <laughs> And, and you kind of, it's, it is kind of a mind blowing film. I have to say, it's, it's hard for me to even come up with the words for it, but you sort of bring up this notion of who is mythologizing you? I mean, it kind of makes you wonder, like, oh, I could turn on the computer, you know, or my phone or something. And, and has someone incorporated me into a, a mythology without me realizing it? In a way, that's what happened to Renee, mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be no way for her to realize what this thing would become. And she kind of chose to absent herself from that ultimately, which is really interesting and, and raises a question of, can we do this in a digital world? Can we erase or contain or have any control over how we are incorporated into this vast digital culture? Yeah, it's a lot. I think um, something I've been talking about a lot is just the idea. This is my first feature film, and I would really encourage every filmmaker, especially documentary filmmakers, to put themselves in front of the camera. Um, I think it's interesting we talk about the character of Mavis Beacon, and we try to get more nuance to the character of Renee L'Esperance. But in the course of making this, Olivia and I had to kind of reduce ourselves down to characters as well. Um, it's a feature film that spans several years of our lives. Uh, a lot is changing. You see those changes physically uh, on Olivia too. And so- I lose all the baby fat in my face fully. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of track the inconsistencies in time with where like Olivia's face is at. Um, and so what I realized is like in the course of making any film, you kind of have to synthesize and whittle people down to just their essence. Um, and it's a really challenging thing. And I feel like even as the maker of this, I've had to make myself a character uh, and I stand by it. You know, I'm like, that's a good representation of who I am. And I think, you know, Olivia, I'm really appreciative. She had some nice boundaries around, look, we're going to film me. Um, if you want to tell the story of who I am, uh, it's going to be through me. But we're not going to film my family. So every I found my own boundaries. Olivia found her boundaries. And at the end of it, I'm realizing I'm just like, I have so much reverence and respect for Renee's boundaries and the idea that you know, um, it's not guaranteed that everybody wants to be in the spotlight and talk about their experiences. Um, sometimes it is more healing to resolve that in private. <laughs> you are with Neon, which of course is one of the great distribution and production companies here. So congratulations on that. Do you have any sense at this point of after Sundance of say, what festivals you may go to or, or ultimately theatrical distribution? Yeah, just to give a little tidbit and shouts out to Neon. They've been really understanding of this process, I will say. Um, you know, they're a sales company, so just the idea of them entering this project at the end of development and at the onset of production has been such a gift. Um, and we're still figuring out where it may land. I'm really optimistic about the possibility of a theatrical release. Um, I think that this film will be great in the month of June for Juneteenth or a back to school movie. So that's something we're discussing. Um, it's an exciting time and we're still, I mean, it's also a challenging time as a filmmaker at this point in my career. Olivia and I, if you can't tell from the film, we have some pretty defined politics. And so it's just an interesting moment in this industry to think about things like streamers and who we want to be in collaboration with, um, with mm. so much going on. Yeah, it raises interesting questions. Well, you're clearly at the beginning of your career, very young, but it's, I mean, man, it's a brilliant 
film. And uh, so congratulations to you on what you've accomplished with Seeking Mavis Beacon. I'm sure a lot of people are saying Mavis Bacon. It is not Mavis Bacon. It is Mavis Beacon. As any... The rhyming scheme really helping correct people's oh, pronunciation. Okay. <laughs> For anyone who's ever typed or of a certain era, they know it's Mavis Beacon. We've been joined by Jasmine Jones, the director and lead investigator of the film, and Olivia Michaela Ross, co-collaborator, producer, and investigator. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We're really excited. Thank you.